Well, that was unexpected. I was expecting the usual three hymns and all the rest of it, so I'm up here quicker than I thought. I'd like you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the Acts of the Apostles, the the book of Acts. And uh, as we consider this uh, subject together over the course of the weekend of evangelism, uh, I want to speak about evangelism, but I want to tie it in particularly uh, to the local church as well. I want to kind of put them together because I believe that God intended them to be involved together. The church and evangelistic activity are meant to go hand in hand. So I want to uh, do a couple of readings from Acts. First of all, in chapter 1, I'd like to read verses uh, 13 and 14. Acts 1, 13 and 14, and then we'll read from chapter 2. So Acts 1, verse 13, it says, And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode Peter, uh, both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication Uh, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And then if we can turn to chapter 2, please, and we'll break in at verse 37. Verse 37, and we'll read to verse 47. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation." Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need." And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread, and from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And God will bless that reading from his precious word uh, to us this evening. I want to begin tonight by just thinking about the church and its priorities. And uh, today, uh, in this 21st century, uh, it's kind of interesting. The church is something that fascinates a lot of people. And there are lots of books out there now about how to do church. And there's all kinds of ideas. There's the, uh, the seeker-sensitive church, the purpose-driven church, the signs and wonders church. Uh, there are politically active churches. Uh, there are all kinds of types of churches. And it's almost confusing, really, isn't it? There's so many. And every time a bestseller comes out with a new way of doing church, it seems like there's people clamoring to buy the bestseller and follow the latest trend. But what I want us to think about this evening is this, that uh, the best source of what the church and its priorities ought to be is the Word of God itself. I want us to just go back and say, what does the Bible say about what the church should be like? And it's something that I've I've kind of been fascinated with over the years. And uh, of course, uh, they they make this statement as a good statement that that um, a water source is uh, a water is as pure as its source, right? The purest place you'll find it is at the source. So if we really want to find out what God's intent was for the church, it's good to go back to the source. And over the years, and this is why I want to begin here, I've always read this passage in in Acts 2 with fascination, and I've always kind of started really with verse 41 and 42. And I've, I've kind of preached often on uh, they that, shall, uh, that gladly received his word were baptized and, and then they were added to them and they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, Breaking Bread, Fellowship, Prayers, and kind of saw that as kind of a, a model or a template, right? 
But what I've realized uh, as I've uh, kind of meditated further is actually God doesn't start in verse 41 and 42. He starts further back, right? And, and what I mean by that is this. Uh, verse 41 says, they that gladly received his word were baptized. And then verse 42, they continued. And the point being this, that unless somebody had gone out and preached the gospel, nobody would have gladly received the word and been baptized and been added, would they? It, was, it really had to begin with the preaching of the gospel. That's where it had to begin. If, if those believers had stayed in the upper room and just continued to enjoy one another, then that would have been the end of the story, wouldn't it? If they had just stayed there. I'm glad they didn't stay there. I'm glad they went out from there and preached the gospel. So in my mind, I began to think, well, how do we get the, the essence of the church? Well, we've got to say to begin with is this, that the New Testament church, first and foremost, was a church that was committed to the preaching of the gospel. Because it, there's no way it would have ever gone out of Jerusalem if they hadn't been committed to that. But then the more I think about it, the more I... I kind of, uh, I'm driven even further back and say, well, what were they doing in that upper room in the first place? And it takes me back to Luke's gospel. And if you go there for a moment to Luke's gospel, chapter 24, I want you to notice something important here too. Luke 24. <clears throat> Luke's gospel, chapter 24, verse 49 the reason that they were in that upper room, it says, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And so as we go further back, we have to say this, that in one sense, the Lord Jesus said, before you go out, you better make sure that you have the power of the Holy Spirit before you go out, right? Because if they'd have just gone out of that upper room before the giving of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, it might not have been very effective. In fact, I want to suggest to you it would have been very ineffective. And I know because of the charismatic movement, when anybody even mentions the Holy Spirit these days, we get nervous, okay? Now, please don't get nervous. I'm not charismatic. I'm not going to advocate that we speak in tongues or do anything strange or weird. Not at all. But what I am going to say is this. Uh, without the power of the Holy Spirit, evangelistic work is futile. And I can prove that to you from the Word of God. Again, if you go back to Acts chapter 1 and earlier in Acts chapter 1, the Lord Jesus clearly told the disciples in verse 8, He says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And what he's saying is that without that power of the Holy Spirit, you will not be effective witnesses for me anywhere. In fact, it, prior to the giving of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, I want to suggest to you that the disciples had, after the Christ had been crucified, had been locked in that upper room, petrified. I mean, they were scared witless, right? They had witnessed the mob and their actions in the crucifixion of Christ. And Peter, who without doubt would have been their perhaps most outspoken uh, individual, had denied the Lord with oaths and cursings. And so you'd have to say that if it was just based on these men in and of themselves in their own strength, the, the message of the gospel would never have got out of those bolted doors in the upper room. But the giving of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost empowered these individuals. And we're going to see as we look at this, 
Peter the, the, is going to look at the same mob that had caused him to deny Christ with oaths and curses, and he's going to look at them eyeball to eyeball and say with absolute boldness, you crucified your own Messiah. And you say, what happened to Peter? How did he suddenly uh, cease to be a fearful coward and suddenly have tremendous boldness and conviction? And you'd have to say, the Holy Spirit is the answer right? It transformed Peter from somebody who was weak and cowardly to somebody who was as bold as a lion. Chris said, uh, I should tell you some of my story. And um, uh, perhaps one of the reasons I have an affinity for Tepsi is that well, I started out as an open air preacher. And when I was newly saved, um, I had lived in the city of Leeds for 20 years, and I'd never heard the gospel once. Even though I'd gone to church, Catholic church, my whole life, uh, my parents were very diligent at taking me to Mass, and I went for 18 years, and we never missed. And so, and I went for Catholic education on a Tuesday nights, and, and all of that religion, I never heard the gospel. In fact, I'd never even heard John 3.16. If I had 20 years of age, for the first time in my life, I heard God so loved the world. And the first time I heard it, I thought, wow, that's amazing. If God so loved the world, it must mean he loves me. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I believed in John 3:16 in my home bedroom on the 16th of June, 1981. And I was born again and became a new creature in Christ just through reading the word of God. And you know, the interesting thing is, what bothered me and what troubled me is that I had lived in a city, a big city, for 20 years, and up to that point had never heard the gospel. And I thought, how many more Mike Atwoods are out there? Just getting up in the morning, eating their Wheaties, going to work, doing their thing, and never ever knowing that God loved them and Christ died for them. And I thought, what a tragedy. And then I thought, well, how are they going to hear? I wouldn't have gone, gone into a church. Like when I left Catholicism at 18, I thought that was Christianity. And I thought, if that's Christianity, I'm done. And I, had, I said I'd never darken the door of a church again. It wasn't in a church that I heard the gospel. Interesting. And I wouldn't have gone to a church. And so my thought was, how are they going to hear? And I met another guy, and he had been saved about the same time as me, and he'd, he had got some uh, training in sketchboard evangelism, and he said, Mike, let's go out and do it in our neighborhood. And so he trained me in his living room how to use the sketchboard, and I, I began preaching as an open-air preacher. That's why I appreciate it, although I've never done the Tepsi seminars. Uh, but I did do it in somebody's living room and learn to do that. And I thank the Lord for that uh, because I want to say that uh, even though we were responsible to, to get the gospel out and I was concerned that people were not hearing this message, but I want to tell you my own personal growth, I can put it down to the fact of going out with the gospel because I was a new Christian. I knew, I, uh, I knew people were lost and I knew how they could get saved, but that was about it. I mean, I had not been to any Bible school, didn't have any. And, and the interesting thing was that people would come up after the open air and they'd ask us questions. And I wouldn't have a clue. I'd say, that's a great question. I have no idea, but I'll be here next Saturday and I'll have the answer for you. This was before the days of texting and cell phones and all that kind of stuff. And we couldn't do that kind of stuff. But it drove me into the Word of God to get answers. And there's nothing like aggressive evangelism that will make you dig in scripture for clear answers. And so, so again, I, I think about uh, the, the importance of, of evangelism and getting the message out. So here are these individuals, and, and the Lord says, wait in the upper room till you're endued with power from on high, and then you go with this message. Now, again, I wanna just uh, go back a bit further. Because what did they do while they waited well, to be endued with power from on high? Well, they had a prayer meeting. 
And we read that in chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, that while they're in that upper room, while they're waiting for the giving of the Spirit. Now, we don't have to wait for the giving of the Spirit. The Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is never going to be repeated, just like Calvary will never be repeated. But when we're saved, you come into all the good of what Christ did on Calvary, and you also come into all the good of what was done on the day of Pentecost. So in other words, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit the moment you're saved. So we don't have to wait for his coming, but I need to say that. We, we also, at the same time, need to be conscious of our dependence on the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, and his leading in our lives, right? One of the marks of sonship, those that are the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. And, and I don't know if you, well, you know, you've been to a Lord's Supper and you, you, I know you believe in the leading of the Holy Spirit, right? Have you ever been at a, a Lord's Supper where a theme rips through the meeting and it's so obvious that somebody was writing a script and it wasn't the elders, right? It was the Spirit of God prompting one to get up and give out this hymn and another get up and and it's clearly the spirit leading now let me ask you a question if the spirit could lead like that on a sunday morning could he lead you like that on a monday morning sure he could right easily and he can lead you to share the gospel with people. And I don't know if you've ever had that experience where where you, you just felt prompted i need to go speak to this person and usually, by the way, when the Spirit leads, it's always outside your comfort zone. Right? That's how you know it's not me. Like, like walking up to strangers, that, that, that is not my kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, personality-wise, I am not extrovert with a capital E. I'm quiet. Yeah, yeah, I know you don't think that, but I really am quiet. Ask Chris in the house. They'd hardly know I'm there, really, most of the time, right? Can't stop, can't stop talking. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so but, but when the Spirit prompts and you respond to that, it's amazing how many divine appointments that I have had with people where I felt absolutely, I was on an airplane one day and I feel really convicted about this Chinese gentleman sat next to me that I need to talk to him about the Lord Jesus. And, and I just knew I'd be in disobedience if I didn't do it. So I started talking to this guy and he was on a business trip and he said, you're the third person on this trip that's talked to me about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, well, it's obvious he's on your case. You need to do something about it. And he said, you know, somebody in my apartment block has asked me to read the Bible with him. I mean, what an amazing opportunity. But I'm just absolutely convinced that I've got to talk to this guy. That's the leading in the spirit, right? So what I'm saying is effective evangelism. One of the lessons we're learning here is the vitality of dependence on the power of the Spirit of God. And going back to the open air, every Saturday when we would go out in the open air, and we, every, for two years we would go to this shopping precinct, uh, and we'd go there every Saturday and we'd preach all morning, take it in shifts, the two, two of us would do it. And I want to tell you, every Saturday morning, my stomach, I felt like I could vomit. I mean, I was so nervous. And I'd stand up there, and I, no exaggeration, my knees would be knocking. Like, and I'm thinking to myself, Lord, I, I'd almost like it if it snowed or something. You know what I mean? I'm, I, if I could get out of this. But as soon as you began to speak, the power of the Spirit of God would come upon you. And I'm no, no exaggeration. You, you're just preaching with authority. And minutes earlier, your knees are knocking, right? That's the Spirit of God. That's not natural. That's supernatural. And we need the supernatural power. And I'm so uh, uh, afraid that because of charismatic nonsense that the church, the pendulum has swung so, swung so far to the other extreme that for most of us, we actually ignore the Spirit of God. And I feel that's a tremendous shame. We're going to be effective for God. We need the power of the Spirit of God. The command of God is this, be ye continuously being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a command, Ephesians 5, 18. 
And so we need the fullness of the Spirit, don't we? And we need that in preaching. We need that in gospel work. We need that in personal work. Uh, we need that in every area of life. And so he said, uh, you wait. Don't go ahead until you know that you have the Spirit working with you and through you. And that's a very, very important thing. But then back in chapter 1, they also were in this room and they were praying. And uh, again, I want to suggest to you that um, if we're going to be effective in winning souls for God, we need to be people of prayer. And I, I don't know about you, but I'll be honest with you, I find it a lot easier to study the Bible than I do to pray. Maybe I'm the only one. But I suspect that most of us are like that, right? And I want you just to turn to another verse in Acts. And I, I, this verse has really convicted me a lot in recent times. And it still does. I think it's a very challenging verse. And I want you to notice the apostles, uh, they, they don't want to get sidetracked um, from their primary calling. And so that's why they, uh, they oversee the recognition of, of uh, servants that will uh, take care of some of the problems that were arising in the church. But in verse 4 of Acts 6, they make this statement, but we will give ourselves continually, we will give ourselves. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? You know, we're not going to play at this. We are going to give ourselves, give ourselves continually. And what are they going to give themselves continually to? Prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, I can honestly say that since I've been a Christian, that I have given myself to the ministry of the word. I, I, think, I, I think there are a lot of the Lord's servants could say that. But I would be lying to you if I said to you, to the same degree that I've given myself to the ministry of the word, I've given myself to prayer, okay? And I am beginning to learn the hard way that maybe if I would even give equal priority to prayer and the ministry of the word, that the ministry of the word would be a lot more powerful and effective, right? Because prayer is the mechanism by which we express our absolute dependence upon the living God. And where we recognize and we say, God, without you, I can do what? Nothing, right? Unless you show up, it's this weekend. If the, I'm glad you showed up, but if the Lord doesn't show up, we're wasting our time, right? We're just going through the motions. It's not a preacher that's going to make the difference. It's the fact that the Lord is going to work through a preacher or through the songs or whatever this weekend, right? It's the Lord that does the work. And so we, we have to be people of prayer. And again, I want to challenge you as we think about evangelism. Uh, just, just the dependence upon the Spirit of God, the dependence of God in prayer, the recognition that to see lives transformed, it, it's, it's what God does. He uses us as vehicles, no question, but we need Him. And we need his help. And so, again, can I ask you the question, how is, how is your prayer life? Um, uh, are you, uh, could you say that you spend as much time in the ministry of the word and, and then equal time in prayer? I, I find it easy to read my Bible. I love reading the Bible. I could spend hours reading the Bible, studying the Bible. And when I pray for 10 minutes, I feel exhausted. I mean, I feel like I've really, you know, and, and, and encourage prayer. Uh, find somebody to pray with. Pray together. I have a bunch of guys, and we pray together on the phone. And that, I find that tremendous because I find it easier to pray with somebody else uh, than to do it on, on my own. I find sometimes if I walk and pray, that helps. But I just, whatever it takes, do it uh, so that we can be effective in the gospel. And so, again, as we consider this New Testament church, um, we're, we're seeing that they were a people of prayer. They were a people who were committed to the preaching of the gospel. And again, they, they went out with the gospel. They went out of the comfort of the upper room 
where, you know, you could imagine how they would love to be in that upper room and just tell stories, right? I mean, you, you could just be in there the whole time. Couldn't you, Peter, tell us again about the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, you know, t tell us about that day you walked on. I mean, why would they ever want to leave in a sense? It sounds like a great, comfortable place to be in that upper room. But if they'd stayed there, we wouldn't be here tonight. They've got to go out. They've got to go out. Uh, having expressed their dependence on God, and then when they get out, they have to preach the gospel message. And, um, and that is exactly what they did. It was the first activity of the infant church. And the interesting thing is, it was a corporate activity. They all went out of the upper room, and they stood together as one man. In the average church today, what percentage are actually actively involved in evangelism. Would it be 100% like the Acts 2 situation? Would it be 20%? Would it be 5%? 2%? Maybe not even that, right? And somehow we've lost that. We've lost that. Uh, and you know what happens? Um, and uh, if you're in a church and your only goal is to keep the doors open, I'll guarantee you'll oversee the doors being closed. Right? Where there's no vision, what happens? People perish, right? And somehow we've got to get out of the comfort of the upper room, much as we love it, right? We love the upper room into the cold, stark reality of a lost world with the gospel of Christ. And so I, I want to encourage us to think about that. Uh, my wife and I, we, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time with Christians. And they're the best people on, on earth. I mean, I, I'm treated like royalty everywhere I go. It's amazing. And I, and I love the people of God, but we're more and more convicted. Like, what about the lost world? And the Lord, we've been pr praying, Lord, help us. Give us help in this area to get back to our primary vision. And I'll be honest with you, actually, I feel, I went to Bible college, and when I went to Bible college, I lost my gospel fire. What a terrible thing. I developed a love for teaching the scriptures, but in the process, I lost my gospel fire. And I became kind of a heady student instead of somebody with a burden for a lost world. And the Lord's been helping us, and He's been helping us in evangelism. And I just talked to my wife today and she'd been to get her hair cut. And she said she'd had a great opportunity to share the gospel with her hairdresser. She'd been to Sam's Club and there was a girl, two girls talking, uh, working at Sam's Club and they were talking about marriage. And uh, one of the girls was talking about uh, how horrible marriage was. <laughs> and anyway, my wife was able to get in there and get in and talk about well, you know, when you have two self-centered people together, it can be miserable. But what you need is to be changed. And she was able to share the gospel. And so the Lord's helping us. And, and the Lord can help all of us in this room, whether, you, whether you're a student at Tepsi, or whether you're in a local church, whatever, to be able to move out of the comfort zone and to begin to share the gospel with others. And again, it's this dependence on the Spirit of God, depending on Him to lead you uh, to people, uh, to uh, give you what to say, to give you the words to say, to empower you, and that, that asking God in prayer for Him uh, to enable you. Now, as they went out, um, this, it really was an aggressive gospel campaign that would sweep through the entire Roman Empire. Is that amazing to think about? Just in a, a few short years, they would actually be accused of turning the world upside down. These were people of vision and passion, and they wanted to get this message out. And uh, I want to cut in on Peter's message and just see what was the essence of what they preached. Uh, and uh, it's just interesting to observe. We'll bring in, look at Acts 2, 22. Uh, you men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. 
him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And one thing that's impressed me as I've gone through the gospel messages in the book of Acts is that they always talked about not just the death of the Lord Jesus, his burial, and his resurrection. And uh, a lot of gospel preaching I've heard over the years seems to stop at the cross. Have you noticed that? Christ the substitute, all the rest, he died. But it doesn't kind of go through to the resurrection. But the resurrection is pretty important, isn't it? Especially in a skeptical world like our world, what's one of the greatest evidences that we have that sets Christianity apart from every other religious system? We have an empty tomb, right? We have no burial place where we can go and visit and think that the bones of our leader are in there. They're not there. He, and by the way, I was there last year. He's not there. He definitely isn't. Do you go in there, Chris, and you go see the back of the door? He is not here. He's risen. It's just wonderful. He, Christ is risen. And so, uh, again, to be able to share that message with a, a very skeptical world. But the interesting thing is Peter uh, not only tells the message about Christ, and, and our good news, it's not a formula. It, it's a message about a person, a real person right? Uh, it's the good news concerning Jesus Christ. And sometimes we can get caught up in the formula and, and, and forget that we're sharing a person, a life with someone, and somebody who's precious and dear to us. But Peter is very uh, powerfully uh, applies the message in verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And it says, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And I just think of what a transformation in Peter. Imagine that, you know, just a little girl, uh, a little maid, uh, you're one of his disciples, and he comes out with all these curses. Now he's staring at the mob and saying, you crucified your Messiah. What boldness, right? What what power and authority he has now in preaching. And uh, again, the New Testament church uh, was committed to an aggressive co uh, gospel testimony. Uh, in fact, if we look at uh, 2 Timothy for just a second, because some of us would say um, with all honesty, well, that's okay for people that are gifted but I'm not really gifted. Have you ever heard that? It's not my gift. You ever heard that? <clears throat> I don't think giving is my gift. So does that mean I never have to give? <laughs> right? <laughs> of course I have to give. I'm responsible to give, right? I'm a steward, right, of the resources God gives me. And I, and I am responsible to give. Whether it's my gift or not has nothing to do with it. And so he says in verse 5 to Timothy, and I suspect that Timothy probably wasn't gifted as an evangelist. I suspect just from reading, he's more of a shepherd. He's certainly somebody who was, needed a lot of encouragement. And, um, and Paul says to him, Watch thou, verse 5, in all things endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry. Do the work of an evangelist make full proof of your ministry. So Paul urges Timothy, and again, it wouldn't seem to me that that's his gift, but he said, Timothy, don't ever forget the responsibility to share the gospel. Give out the good news. Do the work of an evangelist. Um, recently, um, this year actually, I've been involved in a couple of gospel campaigns, uh, one uh, in Georgia, 
and one of them in Oklahoma. And uh, as we went uh, with another brother, Grady Dollar, he and I uh, liked to do gospel preaching together, and we, we would go door to door every day. And um, you know one of the amazing things that I found is that the number of doors that we would knock on where people would say, when we would explain the gospel to them, they'd say, I've never heard this before. In Georgia, like, like George, everybody in Georgia is a Christian. Like, that's what they'd want you to know, right? And they're not. And you tell the gospel, and they say, I've never heard that. In fact, we, we would say to them, they, uh, knock on the door, and immediately their response would be, oh, I'm already a Christian. That, that would be the standard response in Georgia. I'm already a Christian. So I would say to them, look, and of course I was, I've lost a few pounds since then. Uh, so I would say, well, I said, okay, I want you to, to help me here. Imagine I'm having a heart attack at your doorstep. And you're a Christian, and I say, tell me, what do I have to do to go to heaven? What would you tell me? And they'd stand there looking at me, and they'd say, I, I don't know. Right? And I said, well, you just told me you're a Christian. Yet you can't tell me how I can become a Christian. What makes you want me to believe that you're really a Christian if you don't even know what one is or how you become one, right? And it was amazing the number of people that we were able to contact and share the gospel with. And again, I just want to encourage us that sometimes we, we have this notion that, um, well, in this country, everybody's heard and all that. It's, it's nonsense. It's the lie of the devil. There are people out there that are in absolute abject darkness. And we have the privilege of sharing the gospel with them. Now, I'm not going to be controversial, but I think it's kind of interesting as we go back to Acts that um, there's several things about this church that stands out to me as I look at the early church. Uh, we say that it was a, a, a gospel preaching church. That's the first real point we're making. It was a gospel preaching church. They went out and preached the gospel. And then in verse 41 of Acts chapter 2, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And what is interesting is that in the New Testament, usually when somebody got saved, guess what happened? They got baptized. Guess when? Well, we got to arrange classes, right? And uh, actually we're going to put you on probation for a few months, and then we'll do some classes. And then if you're interested, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and baptize you, right? I don't see that in the New Testament. I see when somebody got saved, they got baptized. The day they were saved. The longest delay in the New Testament between conversion and baptism was three days. That was Saul of Tarsus. And he had a good excuse. He was blind. But immediately, when the scales fell from his eyes, it says he was baptized. Isn't that interesting? And um, can you imagine the testimony this would have had? Because it says in verse 41, they that gladly received his word were baptized the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now can you imagine being in the city of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and there are 3,000 people being baptized? What do you think they'll be talking about in Jerusalem that day? I think that would be a big talking point, wouldn't it? And it would have been in a public place. They didn't have one of these nice things at the back like this. By the way, I have to say, I like this building, but I don't like those. I really don't like in-house baptistries. I, I just don't. Now, in Ireland, the eight years we, we were there, uh, we, we, we never, even when we owned a building, we never had a baptistry. So we always used to have to do it in a public place. So we'd either use the local swimming pool. And it was amazing. We'd use a swimming pool and we'd, we'd ask them if we could use it. They said, well, if you're going in with your clothes on, you have to wait till everybody gets out first. But we'd be there just as they're leaving and they see us going in. And so they would always say, well, what are you guys doing? Are you life saving? And we'd say, no, no, we're soul saving. And it would just <laughs> open up opportunities. And uh, one time, this is the best baptism that I've ever 
had the joy of being involved. There were six people being baptized. And uh, this was before we went to a place called Kilkenny, it was in a town called Carlo. And in, in, Isle, in Carlo in Ireland at that time, there was no public swimming bath at all. And these baptisms were in the middle of winter and it'd be like Michigan. It really would be death, burial and resurrection if you put somebody <laughs> under in that, in that weather. So um, we had heard that there was a local pub owner uh, and uh, this, this local pub owner, uh, he was a bit of an entrepreneur and he'd built a swimming pool at the si for the public at the side of his pub. So I went to see this guy and I said, we would like to hire a room and we'd also like to use your swimming pool uh, for a baptism. And he said, sure, that, that would be wonderful. He said, just think of the publicity. Do you mind if we get the media involved? <laughs> <laughs> so we said, sure, we would love that. So, so anyway, the local radio showed up, the newspaper showed up. So we have this room and we're having a little uh, meeting. And I, I said to the guy, do you mind keeping the doors open to the bar? We're not gonna be buying anything, but we would like the people in the bar to witness what we're doing. So, so they're, they're so curious of what's going on in this room. And so we have each of the believers give a testimony. And then I give a brief gospel message explaining what these people are doing. And all the, the doorway is packed with people with their pints of Guinness, Guinness looking over, watching us. And then when we go into the pool, there was a balcony overlooking the pool. And so they all filed up the balcony with their pints of Guinness. And every time we put somebody under, they raised their glasses and said, cheers. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> and yet I want to suggest to you that those believers that were baptized that day, it opened up so many opportunities. One of them worked uh, in a, a hardware store. His name was Kevin. He received the nickname Kevin the Baptist. And every time anybody would go in there, they would say, are you that guy that was in that pool with your clothes on? You know, they would ask those kind of, and he would have opportunities, you see. So, so again, you just see this corporate act action of the gospel going out from the church and then baptism very very important principle and, and by the way why is baptism so important uh, scripturally I want us to go back to Matthew 28 and I just for a moment um, and we're not going to go through the whole of these principles in the church because that's not our purpose this weekend but while we're on this issue of seeing people saved seeing them baptized and the, the joy of, of baptism. Um, uh, Acts 28, verse 18, it says, Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power, or literally all authority, is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world, amen. Now I want you to notice the Lord's command is to go and teach or make disciples of the nations. And I wanna suggest the first step of that discipling process is given next. You go, you make disciples of the nations, baptizing them. Because then in the next verse, it's teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And I think what he's saying is this. Listen, if they won't obey the first command, what makes you think they'll obey any others? Right? In other words, if you're not going to obey the first one, why are you suddenly going to get serious even ignoring that one, right? Right? And that first command is, is a command of such importance because it's a command of confession and identification. On the one hand, we're saying, we're acting out what's happened to us. That, that when I was saved, uh, when Christ died, I died with him. All that I was in Adam died 
with Christ. Not only did he die for me, but I died with him. Isn't that wonderful? And that God didn't even want to leave that stinking, rotten corpse, Mike Atwood, around for a single day. He said, you get him buried, right? And out from that grave comes a new man. Resurrection life, right? In Christ. And then not only that, as we're doing this, we're making a confession that we believe in one God who eternally exists in three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? We're being baptized in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, Holy What a tremendous, tremendous thing a baptism is. Isn't it an amazing thing? What a, you're acting out, in a sense, what's happened to you. You're confessing what you believe, and you're being a tremendous uh, witness for God. And, and I want you to look at Acts chapter 10 just for a second, because I don't know why, but I feel like we're so wimpy today in the church that we, we kind of suggest that people consider baptism. But I want to say the New Testament is none of that nonsense. Uh, it, <clears throat> uh, I want you to notice um, in verse um, 46, uh, uh, sorry, verse 47 of Acts 10. This is Cornelius, the first Gentile converts, the house of Cornelius. And, and uh, after they've believed, it says, uh, and again, this is the very same time this is all happening. He says in verse 47, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And then notice verse 48. And he suggested to them that it might be a good idea that they sign up for some baptism classes and consider it over a lengthy period of time. Uh, sorry, did I read that right? What does it say? And he commanded them. He commanded them to be baptized. That's pretty strong, isn't it? In the name of the Lord. In the authority of the Lord, he commanded. You say, well, that was Peter. He was an apostle. Well, on the apostolic authority of the word of God, if you haven't been baptized, I command you, get baptized. You're in disobedience to your Savior. Imagine dying and going to heaven, and you've disobeyed the public identification with your Savior. You see, so I see this early church. They're, they're not playing games. These guys are serious. They are really serious. They're serious about getting the message out. They're serious about confronting people with their sin. You crucified your Messiah. That was their sin. Uh, con confronting people with their sin. Uh, telling them they need to trust the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then upon their confession of faith, commanding them to get baptized. And so as we consider this early church, we see a pretty aggressive, dynamic, bold testimony for Christ. And you say, we've lost our way a little bit, haven't we? We've become a bit wimpy. And we need to get back to aggressive Christianity. In the power of the Holy Spirit, not in our energy, not in our uh, human flesh, because that would absolutely stink. It's a gospel preaching church. It is a church that when converts are saved, they're baptized, a, a, a church where believers' baptism is taken seriously. And then our final thing, and then we'll wrap up for this evening. It's a committed church. And I want you to go back to Acts 2 and just see this. And I, I just, I find today um, there's a total lack of commitment. But in the early church, it says, they that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And then notice this, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. And today you might translate that. Uh, you know, if we compare it with contemporary Christianity, somebody believes the gospel, they're kind of uh, on probation for however long before they eventually come around to getting baptized, and then they continue seldomly in the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread, fellowship. In other words, if it's convenient, and, um, you know, kind of the wind's blowing in the right direction, they don't have anything on, they'll come, right? But in the early church, 
they continued steadfastly. And that steadfastly means fixed as in purpose, firm in resolve. Like they were, like it was a commitment. Now again, when I, when I get saved, um, like uh, I was a, a drinker, a drunkard, I suppose you would say, before I got saved. And um, pretty quickly after I was saved, I immediately stopped drinking and all my friends disappeared into the sunset. I mean, they didn't want anything to do with me. And um, I have to say that the midweek meeting and the Sunday meetings were absolutely life to me. I mean, I mean, I just didn't know that I could survive a whole week without the encouragement of meeting with the people of God. Because I was getting none in home. My parents were absolutely deadly opposed. My, my parents would rather have seen me a drunkard than be a born again Christian. They were not happy. And so, so in all honesty, uh, commitment to the local assembly wasn't even an option. It was, it was life and itself to me. I had to be there because my spiritual life depended on it. But I am so thankful for those days with the saints of God and the lessons learned with the people of God. And so again, I want to just encourage you as we consider evangelism this weekend, I want us to see it as not, we tend to think of it just an individual thing, but here we see a church that has a vision. I'd love to see churches. Now I was talking to a brother this afternoon and they have a community gospel supper once a month. And he said, Mike, he said, the last one we had 45 unbelievers came out to the community gospel supper. And he said, they just had three people baptized. Um, they, um, uh, and received into fellowship and the work is really going. I was talking to another brother. He said they, they were so concerned about the lack of uh, fruitfulness in the gospel in their assembly that last April, they started a early morning prayer meeting to pray for the lost in the community. And he, he told me, he said, Mike, since then, we've had seven converts, all baptized, all in fellowship, since April, since we started praying for the lost. And he said, it's just amazing how it's happening. Um, uh, these, they're being converted. Um, one of them, he said they had a baptism, and one of the converts, he was a converted out of the old order Mennonites, horse and buggies, right? The other guy that was converted was a former druggie covered in tattoos. So they had this baptism and all the old order Mennonites from the community came out in their horse and buggies. They did it in a pond and they're, all the buggies are kind of around in a circle looking, watching this baptism. And all the druggies old pals came to witness his baptism. He said, Mike, you never saw anything like it in your life. <laughs> it was amazing. These two groups, you talk about polar opposites, right? All there, what are they witnessing? The power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to transform lives. Isn't that pretty exciting? It started in a prayer meeting in April. Where's it going to end? <laughs> I, I can't wait to see where it's all going to end. And they said they usually on average get 12 guys showing up to this prayer meeting every week. Crying for lost souls. What a tremendous thing. Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm tired of just going through the motions. I want, to be, I want to see the Lord do something like that today, don't you? I want to see it in my assembly. I want to be involved in it. I want to be part of it, right? Lord, just let me at him. That's what I want, don't you? Well, you know, I, uh, if somebody had not shared the gospel with me, and again, I wasn't uh, your typical assembly material, often coming into work on Monday morning, still inebriated after the weekend binges, but somebody shared Christ with me in the workplace. I wouldn't be here today if they hadn't done that. I may not even be on planet Earth today if they hadn't have done that. The way my life was headed, 
I may have been in eternity in hell. I am so thankful that that person had the courage to confront me with the claims of Jesus Christ. Can I encourage us this weekend? Let's pray, Lord, give me boldness. Thrust me out. Put me in a situation where I've got to say something. Do whatever it takes, but get me out of my comfort zone in the power of your Holy Spirit to begin to share the gospel with a lost world. I think it'd be a great way to begin, wouldn't it? Just to really say, Lord, help me in this. <clears throat> May the Lord encourage us with these thoughts where it'd be a good time to stop. Thank you for your attention, Tim.